I've got a simple question, really, to start off this little message. Are you content? Are you content? Most of us live pretty comfortable lives. And even those of us who feel like they have it hard, know deep down that things could be a lot worse. You might think that at times, I, I have it pretty hard right now. But deep down, you know, it could be way worse than it is. Let me share with you a, a quick story. I came to know the Lord in a psychiatric ward. I was there for drug addiction. And when I was placed there, I wasn't really fully aware of the kind of place that it was. But then I realized that it was a psychiatric ward. And there were only a few of us who were like me, coming from drug addiction. Almost everyone else was uh, a patient for mental illness. They had schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, and that kind of thing. And it was really, really difficult. And I, I tell you, this is where I came to know the Lord. And I genuinely wanted to get better. I wanted to overcome this sin. But the situation was difficult. There were 25 of us in one room, smaller than this room. There was one toilet and one shower, all in a corner, no walls, no privacy whatsoever. There were often, almost every day, fights over cigarettes, and the cigarettes really were our currency. It was a little bit like jail, to be honest. We were behind bars 24-7, except for a couple of 15-minute breaks where we could go into the middle courtyard. And because I lived a really good and privileged life up to that point, I often felt very sorry for myself. I thought, this is so bad. What have I gotten myself into? I'm struggling. But here's the thing. I was fed three times a day. I had more than one t-shirt and more than one pair of pants. If you think about it, that's one more than any person needs at any given moment. You don't wear two shirts and two pants. So I was well taken care of, actually. I had shelter, a roof over my head. And as a new Christian reading the Bible, I started to understand how blessed I actually was, even if I was in that crazy place. And as I've shared with you guys my testimony before, I came to the understanding as well that I was no better than any of the patients in that ward. In fact, many of those people didn't want what they had because they were born a certain way and they had a mental illness. Or I knew a guy there who was hit over the head with a huge wooden plank and he was never the same again and therefore he was stuck at this ward. I was the crazy one. I was the one that put myself in that situation because I loved my drugs. I wasn't born um, in that way. I was born a sinner though. That's one thing we had in common. So I came to realize that I, I not only, I'm not only not any better than these guys, I probably deserve way worse than these guys. I was coming to an understanding of the grace of God with a backdrop of the darkness that I was in and the sin that I had committed. And I made a really good friend there, a guy who was there for the same reason as I was. Uh, he was, he was a fellow recovering drug addict. And one day my family sent chocolates and we went crazy. My friend and I gave some away. We were super popular that day because all of the patients were like chocolates and they were, they were wild for chocolates. And then we kept a few, my friend and I, we put them in a little cup and we placed them under our beds, hoping that they would stay cool. There was no air condition or anything like that. There were just bars and it was, it was pretty sunny in the Philippines. We're hoping they would stay cool under our beds. And we promised to wait until the end of the week before we ate them, before we ate them together. We hadn't had anything like that in a long time. We hadn't seen the outside world in a while. And when the weekend came and we finally sunk our teeth into those chocolates, it was like a dream. It, it was amazing. It was something, it was almost as if I had never had chocolate before. And I took away several lessons from that. First of all, you never know how much you have until it's taken away from you. Secondly, you don't really need as much as you think you need. And thirdly, when you have salvation in Christ, 
you already have the greatest thing ever. So everything else is an optional bonus. But many who call themselves Christians don't see things that way. I, for one, was like that. I was a false convert before I, I came to Christ. I was a professing Christian. I called myself a follower of Jesus, but I was never content with Christ because I did not truly have Christ. And I wanted other things. And that was you know, during my days of drug addiction. I called myself a Christian, but why was I indulging and trying to find my satisfaction in these substances, and you've experienced the same thing, and it was maybe just not drugs for you, it was something else. Well, the reason why I was discontent with Christ was because I did not actually have Christ. I wanted other things to fill my heart, to fill my soul. And there were people like this during Timothy's pastorate in Ephesus. To make matters worse, it seems that these people were former teachers in the church. These false teachers are filled with worldly discontentment because they do not truly have Christ. They want to be satisfied in other things because their whole is not filled. While on the other hand, true Christians, they've got otherworldly contentment. This is a message, I hope, that we would be able to come out of with a good answer to the question, are you content. Because Christians are not like everyone else in the world. Last week we saw the Christian's reasonable service in the workplace. And yes, that included, and that was mostly directed to, slaves in the first century. I mean, who are we to complain about our work and our employments when even slaves in the first century were exhorted to honor their masters for the glory of God? So we saw the Christian's reasonable service, and today we see the Christian's otherworldly contentment. The Lord used my time in that psychiatric ward to teach me what verses 7 and 8 in our passage really meant. Turn there. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. The Lord used that experience to teach me what these verses meant experientially. To come up with an answer to the question, are you content? So, please, let's participate in this sermon. Let's try to get out of the other end of this sermon with an otherworldly answer to that question. Before we get to the Christian's otherworldly contentment, though, we need to look at the false teacher's worldly discontentment. And that is really what's going on with them. They are a discontent people. They are not satisfied. And this is nothing new to Paul's first letter to Timothy, these, these false teachers. In fact, they make quite a few appearances in this first letter to Timothy. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said, Charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. In chapter 1, verse 11, that is, those are people who are teaching things which are not in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And remember, Paul keeps on connecting sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, with godliness. The two come together. In a previous passage, he exhorted Timothy, train yourself for godliness. It's so important for Paul to maintain healthy doctrine. It's vital for the health of the church, and that's why in the end of our uh, last passage, in verse 2, there's a, there's a sentence that's inserted in the end of verse 2. Teach and urge these things. Teach and urge these things, healthy teaching, over and against these guys who are trying to be, chapter 1, verse 7, teachers of the law. This is one of the reasons why elders must be, chapter 3, verse 2, able to teach. Now turn with me back to chapter 4. Go back to chapter 4 and you will see in verse 11 that Paul is telling Timothy, teach, or sorry, command and teach these things. In verse 13, he says then, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Why is he saying these things? Well, there's an opposition. 
Go back to verse 1. Some have devoted themselves to what? Teachings of demons. That's what false teaching is. It's really the teaching of demons. That's why if you go down to verse 16, we see, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. And you go to chapter 5, verse 17, those who labor in preaching and teaching are especially worth of double honor. This is huge for Paul. This is huge for the church. And even with all of these exhortations, there's still false teaching. The teachings of men like Hymenaeus from back in chapter 1 is said to spread like gangrene and upset the faith of some, according to Paul's second letter to Timothy. The, the, the false teachers tried to continue and he used a medical term, this idea of spreading like gangrene. It gets worse and worse, and, old, and in the end, you're going to have to amputate before things get any worse. In today's passage, we learn more about these guys. We learn more about these wolves, their teaching, their character, and their fruit. What is, their, what is wrong with their teaching, their character, and their fruit? Well, here's the thing. All of it is corrupt. Some of it can look good, sound good, but at its core, it's corrupt. They've got corrupt teaching, corrupt character, and therefore they produce corrupt fruit. Let's first look at the corrupt teaching in verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. So this is what the false teachers are like. They're not sound. By the way, sound really means healthy. It's another medical analogy. So there's sound teaching, which promotes health and well-being and growth and spiritual flourishing. Then there's false teaching, which is, again, medical, like gangrene, which spreads, which infects, which corrupts, which needs to be amputated. Sound teaching is that which agrees with the words of our Lord Jesus. Sound teaching is that which accords with godliness. So what are the healthy words of our Lord Jesus? Well, you could say that these might be the actual words taught by the Lord Jesus as recorded in the Gospels and sometimes quoted in the New Testament letters. But you know what? Every word of the Bible is ultimately the word of our Lord Jesus. This is all Jesus' teachings. And I think what's actually being highlighted here is that healthy teaching is teaching which originates from and centers upon Jesus Christ. That use of Jesus Christ is, is very much intentional. Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And sometimes it's really hard to pinpoint this idea of different doctrine. That's what Paul calls it. All right? it, might not, it might sound nice and kind of a charitable way of calling out the false teachers, but I'm telling you right now, it's not a nice thing to be said that you're teaching a different doctrine. It's not a good thing because you're saying that you're teaching something that is different from that which Jesus promotes, from that which comes from Jesus and is centered upon Jesus. You're teaching a doctrine that actually takes our attention away from Jesus. That's what the false teachers were doing. And the difficulty here is that it's sometimes very difficult to pinpoint different doctrine because it can sound biblical. It can quote verses, but the theology is corrupt and therefore the interpretations are twisted. I remember once upon a time, this is a true story, I came from the gym, I was going to Subway, this is back in the Philippines, and right outside the Subway I saw two Mormon missionaries just sitting there having a subway. And I have the recording of this conversation, if you ever want to listen to it. I said, hey, are you guys uh, from the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints? Uh, my name is Josh. Can I talk to you about, you know, Jesus and the Bible and blah, blah, blah? And they said, oh yeah, of course, you know, because they're missionaries, right? It's like I'm walking right into, you know, their, their, their snare uh, to, to, to indoctrinate me. So they thought it was a blessing. I sat down and I, I knew a fair bit about Mormon doctrine because where I lived, there was a Mormon temple very, very near us. And in our condominiums, many Mormons lived there. And I would have many conversations with them. So I started to bring things up. And, you know, things were light at first. 
Then we start to get to a lot of deeper things like, so guys, t tell me more about Jesus being the spirit brother of Satan, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, tell me more about what you guys believe um, when it comes to ha uh, having to join the Church of Mormon and going through your processes and what happens there and all those things. And I would ask some of the more controversial questions, those questions and those things that I think very clearly deviate from biblical Christianity. And very often, the missionaries would say this, Oh, that's a deeper doctrine. If you really want to talk about it, come with us to the temple. And I would say, no, I don't need to go to the temple. You're here now. You know, so tell me more about Jesus being the spirit brother of Satan. Tell me more about how God, who God was before he created this universe. Because my understanding is that he was a man like you and me, and he became a god. Uh, and we have the potential to become like him and that kind of thing. And they were going, oh, yes, that's a, that's a deeper doctrine. So those who teach different doctrine that deviate and take attention away from Jesus Christ very often live in vagueness. They're not like historic Christianity that confesses the faith in succinct summaries, allowing the world to see, we're not ashamed, we're not vague, we're clear, here's our confession, this is what we believe the Bible teaches. They, they like to be vague, and they guise it in this idea of mystery, and this idea that this is a deeper doctrine, you know, you won't understand yet, we've studied this in seminary for many years, you should come to the temple if you really want to know what's going on. And because of that vagueness, sometimes different doctrine is difficult to pinpoint. What was the different doctrine in our immediate context just a couple of chapters before? Well, some false teachers, remember, they were teaching asceticism. Remember asceticism? The idea of self-denial as a means to godliness, like don't enjoy marriage. Remember that? <laughs> you like this one. Don't eat food, certain foods. And then we learn that we're actually free to enjoy all of these common blessings that God has for human beings, and we receive them with thanksgiving. Teachings that seem innocent on the surface, but are man-centered instead of Christ-centered. Asceticism was a form of false godliness, but healthy teaching accords with true godliness. It doesn't point people to man. It points people to Jesus, from whom true godliness flows. In fact, He is the mystery of godliness. Just look at that beautiful hymn in the end of chapter 3. It teaches us, that is, healthy teaching teaches us to look to Jesus, to build our lives around Jesus, and to order the church according to Jesus, and to devote ourselves wholly and completely to Jesus. Not men, not man-made traditions, not asceticism, not false forms of external godliness that seem pious on the outside. So this is the corrupt teaching that we see. But there's also an issue of their character, the false teachers, that is. They don't have corrupt teaching alone. They also have corrupt character. Look at verse 4. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. What makes this really sad is that these men don't know how conceited they are. And they don't understand that they don't understand. They don't get that they understand nothing. Back in chapter 1, verse 7, these false teachers are said to be desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So you've got a strong, confident, charismatic teacher, preacher, sounds convincing, sounds biblical, he's quoting verses, must be legit. But really, they don't know what they're talking about. That's the worst kind. And people who are weak in faith, who are still weak in conscience, weak in biblical literacy, will easily be brought along by that kind of teaching. And it's a sad thing to see someone so confident that they're right when they're so horribly wrong. That's a sad thing. Why is the false teacher getting so many biblical teachings wrong? Simple. Because he's got the gospel wrong. You get the gospel wrong, you pretty much start to get everything else wrong. They've got the law wrong. They've mixed and minced law and gospel. 
They did not understand how law and gospel work in God's economy. And that's why Paul exposited the law, Ten Commandments, back in chapter 1. You remember that? How to use it correctly. Uh, we see it in Paul's explanation. Once you start thinking that Christ is not really sufficient, and you start using the law to place a burden, which Christ has already f lifted on the Christian, let alone start subjecting them to man-made laws, you, you mess up that bad, you're going to get everything else wrong. And now, not only do these men get it wrong and have no spiritual discernment, because they've rejected sound teaching, by the way, that, that's what they've done, they've rejected the sound teaching, they also have, look at the verse, uh, what the verse says in verse 4, they also have an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. To put it simply, these men have a combative spirit. They major on the minors, and they want to have unhealthy arguments about things that don't truly matter. They, as chapter 1 verse 4 said, devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote, here it is, speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Instead of clear biblical teaching, clear gospel preaching, these are the kind of guys that like to do, uh, and we, we jested about this before, they like to do 14-week sermon series on the Nephilim. You know, something that is you know hardly talked about and just make it a major thing. This is what the church needs. They need to be fed about the Nephilim, and you know, and be dogmatic about it, but really what's going on is a bunch of endless speculations, myths. And not only do they promote these myths, they're combatant about it. They, 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 they want to be dogmatic about it and shoot people down and have unhealthy arguments. There are healthy arguments and healthy debates, but these people are into unhealthy arguments and unhealthy debates. And I know I've shared this with you guys when I, when I encountered uh, those Hebrew Israelites that were saying that the proper pronunciation of God's name is, is um, Yahuwah. And if you say Jehovah or Yahweh or even Jesus for, you know, for, for the Christ and those kinds of things, you're not really calling upon the name of the Lord. And we had a three hour, two and a half hour sit down with them. And in the end, the main point was still, you got to say Yahuwah. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words. And what was the fruit of all this? Well, in my experience, when I encountered those people who were all about speculations, shooting down other Christians because they didn't have the correct pronunciation of a Hebrew name or word, which yes, of course, it's the name of God, that's important, but really, they just repeated it ad nauseum and made it the central thing. And it deviated from the gospel of Jesus Christ very clearly because they preached a very law-centered message. The fruit of that, well, I'll tell you right now, is that we found out later on that they, this group had much immorality and they were preying on well-meaning young Christians. They were drawing them in to their false teaching and their immoral living. What is the fruit of the false teachers we see? In Ephesus, that Paul and Timothy were facing, well, the fruit was corrupt. That's the third thing. They had corrupt teaching, corrupt character, now corrupt fruit. Look at the end of verse 4. Which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil, suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. These people are filled with envy and dissension. And it's not only false teachers, but this can infect the church. We saw this in Corinth, didn't we? True believers, Christians, that were falling into envy and dissension. Divisions among leaders. It might look like, here's an example, one teacher going behind another teacher's back and trying to get the congregation to lose trust in that teacher and to dismiss his office. Some people tried this with Paul in a congregation. It might look like this. A person might go against their vow to preserve unity in the church and then start openly teaching against the church's confessed doctrines. Maybe because they feel 
that they need to be heard, and that they're envious that others have become teachers and they haven't? Maybe, just maybe, they even went to that church for that specific purpose, to try to turn that church around because his doctrine is better than theirs and cause division. Well, what, what else happens when these false teachers continue in their ways? They're slander. Slandering one another, slandering God's people. You blaspheme God when you slander people in the body of Christ. And as this continues and there's slander, then evil suspicions quickly follow. Evil suspicions, meaning that people start to just expect the worst of each other. Maybe you've been in that situation where so much sin has infected a group of believers that we now begin to start to think the worst of each other. We're just skeptics now. Or when it happens when somebody in the congregation begins to, uh, in a sneaky undercover way, uh, take some people, teach them a certain way, over and against what is being preached, what is being taught clearly by the church, under the, ba- under the backs of the leadership, solely so that the congregation would lose trust in the minister, lose trust in the teachers, whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, it's evil suspicions. Next thing you know, the pastor can never say a single thing right. Nobody trusts him anymore. No one believes in him. Their image of him has been tainted, even though no teacher is perfect, but even when he's already saying lots of things that are correct, they won't even listen. They think the worst. Then this corrupt fruit grows, and then it goes into full bloom. Constant friction. Constant friction in the church. A church split waiting to happen. That's what happens when these false teachers continue. This is their attitude. They're the ones exuding this behavior. This happens among them, and they are called those who are depraved in mind, that is, corrupted in mind, and deprived of the truth, that is, deprived of the doctrine of Christ. These people eat each other, but if you don't stop them, they will eat others. And this is the exact opposite of what healthy teaching does. And all along, this is sad, here's the motivation. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Financial, material gain. That's why they became teachers. That's why they became prominent. Even back in those days, the stipend, the love gift was substantial. The love gift was attractive. That's why elders are called to shepherd, not for shameful gain, 1 Peter 5, 2. And elders must not be lovers of money in the qualifications in chapter 3. Get this, these false teachers are going through all this trouble. They're teaching all these different doctrines. They've given themselves to asceticism for profit. They are filled with worldly discontentment. They've got false motives. They're not happy with what they have, and they won't settle for solid gospel preaching, so they get people to listen to their mysterious teachings. They make much of themselves, and they take people's attention away from Christ, and then they take home the cash. That's what these false teachers do. I want to recite to you a portion of Shai Lin's song, False teachers, You're probably familiar with it. Here's a portion from his song where he speaks precisely of these people. It's foul and deceitful. They're lying to people, teaching that camels can squeeze through the eye of a needle. Ungodly and wicked, ask yourself, how can they not be convicted, treating Jesus like a lottery ticket? And you're thinking they're not the dangerous type, because some of their statements are right. That only proves that Satan comes as an angel of light. This teaching can't be believed without a cost. The lie is you can achieve a crown without a cross. And I hear it all the time when they speak on the block, even unbelievers are shocked how they're fleecing the flock. And these false teachers who are, as this man said, fleecing the flock, are very much in contrast then with those who teach sound words. Those who teach sound words, those who teach healthy, Christ-centered doctrine, 
And in general, true Christians, they're not discontent and into selfish gain. These true Christians have an otherworldly contentment. They don't, they don't even desire to do something such as fleece the flock, take home the cash, because they've already got everything they need. True Christians are content with Christ, the mystery of godliness, and are therefore happy even with just the bare necessities. So, firstly, true Christians and their otherworldly contentment, they are content with the mystery of godliness. Verse 6, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. You see the words godliness and gain, they do go together. But the false teachers messed up the sentence structure. Godliness is not a means to gain. Godliness is gain. Godliness is great gain. It's not a means to an end. It's an end in itself. It is spiritual gain, not monetary or material gain. And to be specific, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is the kind of life that flows out of our union with Christ, who is the mystery of godliness, that beautiful hymn that we just should never forget in the end of chapter 3. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. It's all about the person and work of Jesus. Godliness is that life which flows out of union with Christ. Contentment, then, is a life that finds its sufficiency in Christ. So the only way you're ever going to be content is by looking to the mystery of godliness. And this mystery is none other than Jesus Christ. If you have Him, you have everything. You shall not want. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Listen to the words of Paul. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. When you think about it, one of our greatest needs is, yes, forgiveness of sins, but is righteousness. If we're ever going to be truly rich and accepted in the kingdom of heaven, which is the greatest thing, we need righteousness. And Jesus provides exactly that. The thing that we so desperately need, and He gives it to us for free. We receive it by faith. And then it says in verse 10, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Behold, Jesus Christ, the mystery of godliness. The mindset here, the mindset of Paul and what he is teaching there is that when Christ died, we died with him. When he rose, we rose with him. And for because Christ suffered, we should expect to suffer with him. And all of it is worth it because that's part of being in Christ. And unless you have trusted in him for salvation, his death is not your death. His resurrection is not your resurrection, and His sufferings are not your sufferings. Godliness and contentment, great spiritual gain, is available to all who have faith in Jesus. You see, when it comes to that precious righteousness which you need in order to be accepted by God, again, you are totally bankrupt. You don't have it. You have nothing. But through faith in Jesus, listen... His righteousness is yours. His treasures are yours. His riches are yours. He is yours. And you are all His. And if we're content with the mystery of godliness, we will be content even with just bare necessities. Look at verse 7. 
for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. There, there it is, the Christian's otherworldly contentment. Is it because we're just so good at living with little? We're minimalists? No. Actually, we're not good at that. Left to ourselves, we would be discontent every day of our life. We have this otherworldly contentment because something outside of ourselves is fully sufficient. We have this contentment because we could lose everything in this world and still have the most important thing, Christ. Redemption. Communion with God, fellowship with the Spirit, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. We have been united to one who is infinitely rich and his riches are yours. And most importantly, he is yours with Christ. And only with Christ, we like Paul are able to say, listen to what he says in Philippians 4, 11, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Through Christ. Christ is ours, and therefore everything in this world, whatever it is, living in much, or living with little is bearable. It is something we can accept with open arms because we have Christ. We are richer than the richest kings and princes in this world, for we have the Son of God with Christ. Even the bare necessities are more than enough. So Christians, are you content? May your answer be, apart from Christ, not at all. But with Christ, I can't help but be content because He is everything. And now, a word of caution is necessary for all with ears to hear. Here's our conclusion. We conclude with a cautionary tale. Verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In other words, this was a true story. There were men, there were some, who have gone this route in Ephesus. And Timothy knew some of these people. The congregation likely knew about this. You, brothers and sisters, may know some people who have wandered away from the faith because of greed, selfishness, money lust, because the things of this world were just way more attractive to them, than living the Christian life and following Jesus, true Christianity just didn't profit them anymore. So they turned to something else. They slowly but surely and inevitably deviated from Christ. They were tempted. And because they weren't truly in it with a love for Christ, they were pierced with many pangs. They were ensnared by sin. They plunged into ruin and destruction. Where does money lust get you? The world of immorality that is open to you, if you want to continue going down that rabbit hole, more and more and more and more sin makes itself available to you. And if left unchecked, this is what lust for money does. And it's not the money itself, it's the greed that we're talking about, which leads to all kinds of evils. And if you go down this route, 
this route of greed and worldly pleasures over satisfaction in Christ, you will, you will be pierced with many pangs. What is that talking about? Griefs. A life of unsatisfaction, of discontentment, disappointment, and grief. It should be obvious then that these people, these false teachers who are in it for the gain, who are in it for the money, should be obvious then that they need to be called out, their errors need to be pointed out, their corrupt teaching, character, and fruit needs to be made known. And if it continues to spread like gangrene, just like what Paul said, it needs to be amputated. It needs to be cut off, not because we hate people, but because we love God. And we know that we are weak. If we continue to associate with these things and, and allow these things into our lives, any of us can fall. Be careful when you believe that you're standing strong, lest you fall. I want to let Shai Lin have another word in, because he mentions this passage again in his song, False Teachers. It should be obvious then, yet I'll explain why it's in. Peep the Bible, it's in 1 Timothy 6, 9-10. It talks about how the desires for riches has left many souls on fires and stitches, mired in ditches. Tell me, who would teach you to pursue as a goal the very thing that the Bible said would ruin your soul? Yet they're encouraging the love for money. To make it worse, they've exported this garbage into other countries. My heart breaks even now as I'm rhyming. You want to know what all false teachers have in common? It's called selfism, the fastest growing religion. They just dress it up and call it Christian. Don't be deceived by this funny biz. If you come to Jesus for money, then he's not your God. Money is. Jesus is not a means to an end. The gospel is he came to redeem us from sin. And that is the message forever I yell. If you're living your best life now, you're heading for hell. But if this is not you, if you're not in it, with this false motive. If you're not here because of greed, I don't even know what you would gain anyway from what we're doing, being worshipers of God, being disciples of Jesus Christ. If the Lord has so turned your heart from being lustful and money hungry and greedy and selfish and in love with worldly pleasures and has converted you to Christ, if you've come to Him and have fallen in love with His beautiful person and have rested in His finished work, you need not fear. You will have hard times, but you will be taken care of. You will experience great loss, but you will always be provided for. So let's conclude with a word from our Savior Jesus. Turn, please, to Luke chapter 12. Listen to your Lord. Listen to your King. Listen to your Savior Jesus in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. When you are not content, you are filled with worries. The antidote, according to Jesus Christ, for worry, the cure for worry is finding our sufficiency in God, in all that He has, in trusting that He owns everything, and in knowing that He loves His children, 
that if he's clothing the animals, what more will he provide for you and take care of you and sustain you? Because he is a loving father. There's no need to worry. There's no need to be discontent. He continues in verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're thinking about needs. You're thinking about the necessities of life. You're, you're, you're killing yourself worrying about some of your provisions. And some of these things are not even needs. They're really wants. And you're losing sleep over it. You're worried. You don't know how you're going to continue. You're scared. Jesus goes above and beyond saying, don't worry, there will be bread tomorrow. Don't worry, you'll get clothes. Don't worry, you'll have a roof over your head. He could have just said that, but he goes above and beyond and he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Just give you. The, that's, every, that's, that's everything. That's the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Are you content? May Christ be your contentment. May your contentment be found not in this world, which will soon pass away, but in something much greater, in the kingdom of God. Please pray with me. Our Father, our loving Heavenly Father, our God who looks upon us with love, who sees us clothed in the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ, who cares for us, provides for us, sustains us, blesses us, loves us with an everlasting love. Oh, our Father, thank you for making yourself known to us in this way. Thank you for using human family relationships as, as parents and children, a father's love for their children, to give us a tiny glimpse of the love that you have for your people. Lord, may we not be people of little faith. May we trust that you've got our backs in this difficult life. That even in pain and suffering and great loss, you are with us. That you sustain us. Make us content. Because of our sin, we don't want to be. We want to find contentment in other things. But please, Lord, stop that from happening. Sanctify us that we may not find any contentment in things of this world, but in Christ alone. Help us to know and understand and cherish and rejoice in the fact that our sufficiency is in Christ. Please, Lord, may we not be the same coming out of this message. May our discontent hearts be refocused towards Christ, who is everything. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.